This is your brain, and there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus, which is a little bit like a filing cabinet. Within that filing cabinet, you store what we often refer to as normal memories. Now, normal memories have a number of different characteristics. These memories are generally organised, categorised and sequential. They are verbally accessible. And you have control over the retrieval of these memories. For example, if you wanted to retrieve a memory of what you did on New Year's Eve, then you could probably provide a fairly coherent account from A to B. These memories are time-tagged, which means you know when they happened. You know that your memory of New Year's Eve was just after Christmas and sometime before you went back to work in January. And these normal memories can be updated by new information. This means that if you had a memory of arranging to meet a friend on New Year's Eve who didn't turn up, your memory might have been that your friend let you down. If you later found out that your friend had been in an accident, you would update the memory to include this new information. The hippocampus your normal memory store is connected to a number of higher function brain regions involved in regulating emotions, language and abstract thought. And your hippocampus helps you to process, interpret and contextualise information. Now, imagine that you are heading out today. You might be thinking about what you've been doing so far today. You might be wondering what you'll have for dinner, what time your partner will be home, whether or not you locked the back door, worrying about somebody remembering something that you've forgotten to do. You might be looking at your mobile phone. At any one time, we process a lot of complicated information and emotional responses. Imagine all of this is going through your mind just as you're about to cross over the road and suddenly you see a truck hurtling down the road towards you. What happens? Well, there's another part of your brain called the amygdala, which is like the brain's alarm system. You are faced with danger, be it a large truck coming towards you, someone physically assaulting you, or you being faced with a situation that you judge to be life-threatening in some way, and the alarm goes off. Essentially, danger, do something, or get hurt. Your amygdala, your brain's alarm system, sends a signal to the rest of your brain and your body. Your heart starts racing so that oxygen is pumped around your body to your muscles so that you are ready for action. A number of hormones and neurotransmitters are released, such as cortisol, adrenaline and noradrenaline. This is your body's fight-flight-freeze response. Your body has prepared you to very quickly gauge how to respond to maximise your chance of survival, to step back or quickly run across the road before being hit by the truck. It's a fast and efficient system, and in order for your brain and body to respond quickly and efficiently, your hippocampus goes offline. This means that in times of extreme trauma, information is not processed in the same way and your brain stores a different type of memory, a trauma memory. Trauma memories have different characteristics to normal memories. I like to think of them as these red spiky fragments. They are generally not well organised and sequential. They are fragmented. You have little control over the retrieval of these memories, which means they tend to come back involuntarily without warning. They are situationally accessible, which means they are usually triggered by reminders in the environment. They are not time-tagged, which means it's hard to place when they happened. It feels like these memories are frozen in time, and when they come back, it's like they're occurring again now in the present. And when they come back, they tend to be associated with all of the same emotions and unpleasant physiolog physiological sensations that someone experienced at the time of the trauma. There has been a lot of research into the neuropsychological basis of PTSD and what the experts think is happening is in the aftermath of a traumatic experience, your brain is attempting to process these memories and put them back into the filing system. Following a traumatic experience, almost everyone will experience these intrusive spiky fragments of memory. In some cases, because these memories are so intrusive, overwhelming and distressing, people do whatever they can to stop them from coming back. They avoid anything and anyone that might trigger the memories. They try to develop strategies to block and suppress the memories, whether it's through drugs and alcohol, distraction, or leaving no space to think and feel. However, what we know about blocking and suppression is that the more you try not to think about something, the more it tends to keep coming back. A stupid example 
is to try as hard as you can not to think about a pink elephant on a bicycle. Another example is thinking about a small child who comes downstairs and says to you, I'm scared because there's a scary monster under the bed. And instead of going upstairs with the child to look for the monster, you say, don't be stupid, sit down and eat your dinner. The child's fear of the monster isn't going to disappear. It might even get worse. Your trauma is the monster under the bed. And you might find that the more you try to ignore it and push it away, the more it keeps coming back.